July 1971. A British flag flying limply in a temperature of around 100 degrees and a motley crew of assorted paddlers loading a truck 5,000 miles from home. The town is called Salida on the Arkansas River, 50 miles from Denver, Colorado. 35 people, many of them strangers to each other, were gathering here to mount an expedition. Fiberglass canoes on the roof, people and supplies inside. The whole thing had begun nearly 12 months earlier when Chris Hawksworth had put forward the idea of a British kayak expedition to the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River. And now it was underway. Or very nearly. Another 480 miles of hot, uncomfortable driving over mountains and burning deserts, keeping on the move through the night to avoid the worst of the heat. And finally, stopping just one hour's drive away from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Tired, undoubtedly but excited too, and inevitably, imaginations raced ahead. Only two members of the party had made the trip before. Were their stories of waves 20 feet high really true, or just fishermen's tales? Morning, and for a while they were simply tourists. The squirrels turning out to see if they'd brought any nuts. The local birds, sublimely indifferent to the breathtaking grandeur of the surroundings. But for tourists with a purpose, getting on was important. Even short delays to refasten slack ropes were irritating. Over the little Colorado, not even a river just now, but unbelievably completely dry, waiting for the sudden rains which would bring it back to life again. 35 hot, impatient bodies across the last stretch of desert in one cattle truck and a hire car, stretching for a glimpse of the real thing, the Grand Canyon. The starting point was to be Lee's Ferry, named after John Doyle Lee, a Mormon leader of the 1860s and one of the few spots where it is possible to reach the water by road. So over the Navajo Bridge, across the river. The river, the one they had come to see. The one and only Colorado. A very calm, placid looking river from this height, giving no hint of the possible dangers ahead. There had been no rain and the water was low. But it was time for more activity. Paddles, canoes, kayaks, crash helmets, life jackets and all the other gear they were going to need on the river for the next ten days and nights. If it had felt hot on the trucks, it seemed hotter still now as they sweated to unload it all. They were beginning to get to know each other by this time, as in any group with a common purpose, thrown together in strange surroundings. And finally, the most essential supplies of all, 42 crates of it. Meanwhile, one truck and the car were being driven another 200 miles to the takeout point at Diamond Creek, ready to collect the party at the end of their trip. While the others waited, Alan Donnelly couldn't. No way to launch a lady. Not into ice cold water from the bottom of Glen Canyon Dam, just above Lee's Ferry. A way of passing time, though, waiting for the off. OK, said someone, let's go. And there it was. Shortly before midday on the 6th of July, the first British kayak expedition to the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River was actually underway. The paddlers took to the water and stayed there, pleased that the long journey was over. The party consisted of 23 paddlers and nine passengers, traveling aboard three support rafts, great snake-like rubber pontoons left over from World War II, and now earning their keep on the Colorado River in the employ of a company called Hatch River Expeditions. Limestone, sandstone, calm water. Was this the fearful river, the great unknown of the traveler's tales? 
Certainly the water was beginning to get choppy, but at this point along Marble Canyon, there was nothing to indicate signs of the ferociously wild rapids they had been led to expect. Almost exactly 100 years earlier, the first descent of the Colorado had been led by John Wesley Powell, a one-armed ex-major of artillery in General Grant's army. In 1971, Big Jim Hall, the Hatch chief boatman, was able to give better support than Powell ever knew. But now, as then, the man in the water is still entirely on his own. And so they hit their first major rapids, Soap Creek, grade seven on the canyon scale, and 11 miles downriver of their starting point. Even for canoeists of Olympic standard, this was big water, bigger than some of them had ever seen in their lives. Peter Robinson from Sheffield. And Pauline Squires, destined to become the first woman single kayakist ever to run the Colorado. Grim determination. For Pauline, as for the others, a big test of courage and skill. And the C2, first one of its kind on the canyon. Two men with a single paddle apiece. At Soap Creek, Don Charlesworth capsized. This wasn't the first, nor indeed would it be the last time that someone went under. And although canoeists of this class have all the skills, Soap Creek provided hazards which needed to be treated with very great respect. As someone said, Soap Creek was a very hairy rapid. Successive rapid provided more thrills for the raft passengers, but the paddlers were finding ever increasing demands being made on their skill and courage. Ernie Lawrence was thinking that each rapid seems to be just that little bit worse than the one you tackled yesterday. And the rapid you tackled yesterday, you imagine is just about the limit of your capabilities. So you always have this nervous feeling all the time. Before each rapid, they beached and had a good look, sizing up the water, choosing the right path analyzing the conditions. Their individual reputations were at stake, they felt, in the eyes of the others. You look at the others and wonder if they're as frightened as you are. Some of them look very, very cool, and you know that they're darn good canoeists. Then suddenly somebody will make a move, and immediately everybody will rush, because nobody wants to be first, and equally nobody wants to be last going down the rapid. So you try to get in your boat and get out quick. The quicker you can get to the top of that rapid, the better, because it can be quite frightening. Well, the first thing you notice is the noise, tremendous roar. You're in the canyon and the noise from the rapid is echoing back off the walls. You can't think very well because it numbs you a little bit, this tremendous roar. Up till now, you expect to see a lot of foaming white water to accompany the noise. But at the top of the rapid, it's just glassy green. Then the river seems to disappear in front of you. And then suddenly, it's like a roller coaster. You start sliding down the green water. And while the feeling of trepidation at each succeeding rapid never quite disappeared, a sense of mastery, of gradually increasing confidence, was taking shape.
Three days gone, and time for the lunch stop at the astounding Red Wall Cavern, an enormous natural cavity ground out of the canyon wall by the sheer force of river water over generations, pounding out a hole big enough to hold a crowd of 40 or 50,000 people. Heaven forbid, say the conservationists, that such a throng should ever reach a spot as remote and beautiful as this. Even the river does not reach the cavern anymore. Not since they built the great dams at Flaming Gorge and Glen Canyon to generate hydroelectricity for Los Angeles, 400 miles away. A sudden demand for electricity on the Pacific coast could affect the flow of this river to such an extent that an hour's stop might see a drop in level of five feet or more and the rafts would have to be manhandled back into the water. The further down they went, the more difficult it became to anticipate the rise and fall in the level of the river, since the water itself, after being released at Glen Canyon, took longer and longer to reach them. And there was another factor which affected the water level, sometimes disastrously. Storms in the night, sudden rains and equally sudden flash floods starting in the far reaches of side canyons sent water surging down into the main river, raising its level by eight or ten feet and filling everything with water. The other effect of a flash flood is to bring down silt in vast quantities, turning the water to a chocolate brown. This change in the colour of the river was what the canoeists feared most, because the canoeist relies to a very large extent on the white water in the river to show them where standing waves, stoppers, holes and so on are, so that he can avoid them or take appropriate action. But with the river, this dark brown or blood colour, it was impossible for the canoeist to spot the clear routes down the river. And under such circumstances, canoes inevitably capsized and were broken up. Making camp for the night was a fairly elaborate business, but well organised. It had to be. With 35 people as well as five boatmen, a great deal of gear and equipment had to be loaded and unloaded at each overnight stop, and they all had to depend a great deal on each other's self-sufficiency. The five boatmen belonging to Hatch Expeditions were officially in charge of all the arrangements, including catering. They had brought all the food, and they prepared and cooked it on fires built from driftwood collected on the run-in to the campsite. The travellers were unanimous in their approval of the food provided. Pork, beef and enormous steaks from nearby Texas, filling their plates so full that there was no room for the vegetables. A variety of tinned fruit washed down with beer and soft drinks and the inevitable gallons of coffee, tasting good in spite of being boiled over and over. But each meal started with what became the famous cry of soup and salad, which sent them scrambling into the queue. With so much energy expended during the day on the river, the good food was needed to restore their natural ebullience. Why was he born so Why was he born at all? To begin with, the canoeists were very much individuals. I think most of them were trying to prove themselves as good canoeists. We didn't know very much about one another. And at this stage, we hadn't developed particular friendships. But as the days progressed, we found ourselves clubbing together in small groups and looking after one another and on the rapids. We soon began to realize that anybody that capsized and had to leave their canoe was in very, very serious trouble. And many of them were in serious trouble from time to time, producing an interesting reaction from the hardened American boatmen. First impression was that they weren't very friendly. And then I grew to realize that they were summing us up. They didn't know how to take us. At first, they just watched. And I think they thought that most of us were quite crazy. Then I think they started to appreciate 
the finer points. One distinguished member of the party was John Dudderidge, president of the British Canoe Union, who had also watched and liked what he saw. I was tremendously proud of the British canoeists. I knew they were good. I'd seen them performing in world championships in slaloms. I didn't realize how good until I saw them on some of the major rapids uh, of the canyon. Uh, the Americans who were in charge of our transport rafts were equally impressed, in fact. They had seen some canoeists in the canyon, but they'd never seen the skill uh, displayed that was displayed by this party. By the evening of the fifth day, spirits were high and bodies had got used to the hard work and fierce heat. It might be possible for the expedition leader to relax a little, but for Big Jim Hall and his boatmen, problems. Continual swamping by high water had affected the raft engines. The canoes themselves survived their various batterings remarkably well, but there were casualties and repairs to be done. So while Big Jim and his men carefully stripped down two engines in an attempt to make one good one, other members of the party did fiberglass repairs on their craft, damaged on rocks when they had capsized, their owners going for that dreaded long swim. The Canadian C2 of John Goodwin and Albert Woods had earlier suffered a disastrous battering and was going to need a lot of work to put it back in the water next day. Only one of them had brought a tent. For the most part, they used sleeping bags on top of lengths of polythene tubing. If it rained, they climbed inside their polythene tube tents and kept dry that way. But for most of the time, it was dry, and they slept the deep, relaxed sleep of the very tired, waking reluctantly at first, but refreshed for another day on the river. They got up early, having gone to sleep early. Not much singing at nights, not much shop or canoe talk around the campfire. A few beers and bed to be roused by a variety of clarion calls. They had taken precautions against the effects of the sun, which could lift temperatures in the canyon to around 120 degrees. Tablets to protect against sunburn and tablets to offset the cramp, which can result from prolonged physical effort in such heat. Every morning, tablets, with or without the river water, which was quite fit to drink. It was everybody's aim to get up, get changed, packed up, have your breakfast, and move before the sun came over the rim of the canyon. Because as soon as that sun hit you, it stopped you dead in your tracks with the heat. The uh Conservationists are extremely strict about the conditions in the canyon. 
nothing must be left. There's a standing rule. You took it in and you bring it out. So you can go through the canyon, landing on your beaches, eating your meals, camping there, and never find one smallest particle of litter, not a matchstick, not a piece of paper, anything at all. Uh, the, uh, the conditions in the canyon bottom are complete wilderness. They were soon to meet up again with the little Colorado River, now a beautiful blue-green, providing a startling contrast where it met and mixed with the brown water of the main river. Good to look at, bad to drink. It contains Epsom salts, among other things, and the results can be dire. A team of botanists was braving the river in a different sort of boat. Canyon dories, especially designed for the canyon, they ride the waves very effectively, and they are not driven down by uh, outboards, but are rowed down. Sometimes we saw dories almost standing on their ends on some of the bigger stoppers. It must be a, a very, very thrilling run to go through the canyon in one of these uh, wooden boats. But for the moment, the river had fallen again, so the stranded rafts had to be manhandled back into the water. Incredibly heavy and seemingly glued to the beach by suction, it took every available pair of hands to move them. It seems strange to think that the indirect cause of all their effort had been a mass switch on or off far away on the Pacific coast, even if only of electric light. Planning for the day ahead was always necessary. They would gather round for a briefing from Chris Hawksworth and American canoeist Art Vitarelli, the only two among them who had previously made the trip and who had practical advice to offer on what they might expect to find and the best way to handle it. And meanwhile, the boatmen were busy with their vacuum cleaner, but reversed, so that they were not sucking, but blowing. The rafts tended to lose air during the heat of the day, so that by the time morning came, with its cooler air, they needed pumping up again. The rafts pumped up, the paddlers briefed, all that remained was to clear up, to remove every trace of their presence from the site of the overnight stop, and to load the rafts once more, a task always heralded by that well-known call to action. You've been taken in by the speed of the river. It's maybe moving at 20 miles an hour. And because of this fantastic speed, you think you're moving fast. This is terribly dangerous to the canoeist because he depends on speed to penetrate this white water, to get through it and not to be stopped or to be carried like a twig at the mercy of the river. And the waves aren't moving, they're stationary, just big, big humps, big green humps. And you slowly, it seems to you, climb to the top of them. And then suddenly you realize that you're not moving fast enough, so you have to paddle like fury, because the only way to get through some of this very white, rough water is to hit it as fast as you possibly can. You don't mess about. If you drift down like a log, you'll be thrown around like a log. You've got to be moving faster than the water. So you've got to suddenly cop on and start paddling as fast as you can. With such fierce demands on their powers of concentration and reserves of energy, what was their feeling at the end of the day? Relief. Pure and simple relief. 
and you get out of the canoe and you're delighted that you've made it and then this little thought creeps into the back of your mind tomorrow and you know that each day the rapids are getting bigger this is the nature of the canyon that the rapids get bigger as you go on so that this initial one of relief changes slightly to dismay and you try to push it out of your mind and go and have a good meal and leave tomorrow to look after itself. What one finds will be what one takes the trouble to look for. The brilliant little flowers springing improbably out of the bare, packed sand. The lizard scuttling with incredible speed from spiny bush to cactus clump. The sudden flash of a bright-coloured bird. This dry world, all of which seems so strange to you, is normal to them. It is their paradise, their universe, as it ought to be. The first outsiders to visit the canyon were Spanish conquistadores in the 16th century. Indeed, the name Colorado derives from the Spanish word for red. Spurred on by local Indian legends, they had come seeking great cities of gold. What they found left them distinctly unimpressed. A harsh, uncompromising wilderness and a chasm which proved an impassable barrier to their ambitions. Indians, Spaniards, fur trappers, Mormon missionaries and settlers all came and went about their business without disturbing or even penetrating the canyon's secrecy and hard beauty. The river went on carving its own lonely history as it had done for millions of years. At Hermit, they saw the dory boats again, this time in action, being rowed backwards downstream in an attempt to travel slower than the water, in complete contrast with canoeing technique. As John Dudridge had predicted, it was an exciting spectacle and some of the botanists were getting very wet indeed. I find most interesting the conspiracy of life in the desert to circumvent the death rays of the all-conquering sun. The beaten earth appears defeated and dead, but it only appears so. A vast and inventive organization of living matter survives by appearing to have lost. Animal life wears a hard, dry skin or an outer skeleton to defy the desiccation, and every living thing has developed techniques for finding or creating shade. There may be three or four different places where the rapid can be attempted. You may take the main channel, uh, or if you happen to be rather diffident about doing it at all, you may choose a channel fairly near the side and um, slip through whilst the river isn't looking. It was a, quite, a, quite a trial of strength, not sheer physical strength, but nervous, nervous energy. It expended a great deal. If it gets really bad, like it did, and you think, 
this one is just beyond my capabilities. One slight slip and you could be in real trouble. This happened to me on one of the rapids and I just chickened out. I didn't even bother to paddle down the side chute. I just lifted the boat up and carried it round. At first I was a little bit worried in case anyone would see me. But um, some of the boys probably have more respect for you if you use your intelligence and carry it round anyway and not be the fool that goes down the middle who can't manage it. So even with more than 100 miles of river behind them, they were still learning, never quite sure what the next 100 miles might bring. Sometimes at the end of a very big rapid, there would be a relatively slow running part of the river, deep and smooth, when the heat would really strike. After a day like that, by the time they'd done 25 miles or so, the paddlers were more than ready to stop. The side canyons provided the opportunity to relax, to clean up, to wash off the thick deposits of dried silt which covered their bodies after a day on the Red River. They needed only to clear the grit out of potholes to provide themselves with the luxury of a bath in clear, warm water ready for another day in the sun. Sometimes a still dry heat, but frequently they met something even more tiring, hot winds which blew scorchingly up the canyon into their faces, draining energy from even the toughest. For some, the strength went into the hand. Others spurned the free ride, for the moment at least. Albert Woods felt able to paddle cheerfully in the now repaired C2. And Ernie Lawrence moved methodically through the heat. Alan Miller, for once not making his own way through the water or under it, but taking a tow, like Jim Hargreaves and many of the others. It was possible to sleep while still hanging on. This was something the passengers didn't have to worry about. Graham Castle, one of the two Royal Navy paddlers, was later to make a spectacular triple somersault in the big stopper at Upset Rapid, but as usual would emerge unscathed, much to the amazement of Big Jim Hall and his boatmen, who, although they spent half their life on this river, had rarely seen skills such as the ones displayed by these canoeists. Those skills would certainly be tested again and again on the big rapids towards the end of their trip. But on the calm water, in the heat, the trick was to hang on. And, like John Dudderidge, to keep cool. As cold showers were not part of the facilities available aboard the rafts, it was not surprising that they took advantage of the falls at Deer Creek. Crashing down from a height of 150 feet or more, the water is icy, coming from a very cold spring. It cooled them and prepared them for the run down the next rapid. Upset Rapid was aptly named, as they were to find, with a big stopper right across the middle and a tendency to tip canoes end over end. Alan Donnelly came down in his single-bladed C1, doing well most of the way, until... It was times like this that showed how well they had come together, how their days on the water had transformed them from being talented individualists into a mature team with concern for each other. The first ones down the rapid, or the ones who made it safely, sat and watched out for the ones who didn't. When the capsizes came, the others would converge to pick up the unlucky canoeists, their paddles and their craft. It was good to have been in the water. It was better still sometimes to be back out of it and be safe.
The amazing canyon walls dominate everything. Layer upon layer of rock continually being formed over a period of time so long that it defies comprehension, probably two billion years. Constantly being weathered by wind and water, it has its secret places of solitude and beauty, unexpected pleasures for its visitors. The Colorado is in danger of becoming one of the world's most controlled rivers, such as the demand for water and electricity. New dams are planned, which will submerge more of the canyon's glories, and modify still further the flow of the river, and interfere with the natural process of the canyon's formation. The old dams are already silting up, and will in time become useless, abandoned. Many are saying that such destruction is too high a price to pay for a few years' supply of electricity. On the morning of the eighth day, lava falls, the big one, a grade 10 rapid, very hard to read. The start was clear, with a long, smooth tongue, but it developed into some of the most difficult water they had yet encountered, including a drop of 40 feet in 100 yards. These rapids have never been run with any success down the right-hand side. Even the so-called chicken chute down the left called for technique of the first order. At times it was like being inside a washing machine. It was very difficult to breathe. Your life jacket just didn't hold you high enough. Survival depended on knowing what to do and then doing it quickly. Everybody, of course, had to be a very fluent performer of the Eskimo role. This is the technique whereby the kayak man can right himself without leaving the cockpit. He does a stroke under water, which brings him through the surface and up again. And, uh, but to carry out an Eskimo role in the middle of a Grand Canyon rapid, is the very limit of difficulty, when it's sometimes difficult to know whether you are up or down, which way is up in the spume. It was here that they had the only disagreement of the whole trip. They had decided that the right-hand side of the rapids were too dangerous, but one member of the party chose to think otherwise. He tried and failed, but somehow managed to survive. It was an incident which somehow marred the team spirit built up over those previous days. Had it happened earlier, it might have been more damaging. But lava was the last great rapid of their journey, and at Diamond Creek, the trucks were waiting to take them out. They had covered 225 miles of perhaps the world's greatest river, beaten 25 of its major rapids, brought the first C2 down the canyon, and witnessed the first woman ever to complete the whole distance. Not bad. At Dublin Airport, where they had begun, they sorted out their gear, said goodbye, and went their separate ways. Most of them to England. One to South Africa, two back to the Navy, one to the Army, and three remained in Ireland. It had been an incredible 10 days, and many of them would go back if it were humanly possible to repeat that experience. And the others, the ones for whom this had been the first, and probably the last time, would take pride in knowing that they too had challenged and not been beaten by that wild, white water.